speak with us about research opportunities, career development and research, and whatever you want to tap her expert mind for, for the next 15 minutes. Uh, Lana got a PhD from the University of Florida. She did her postdoctorate at uh, the great Johns Hopkins, um, where I also hail from. Uh, prior to NIH, she was on the faculty at George Washington University and ran the speech pathology services there, and now is at the NIH. And uh, please welcome Lana. Thank you. She's volunteered her time to come up here on her own dime to help us get to where we want to be in terms of our individual and collective research mission as it pertains to, to voice and, and laryngeal disease. So, Lana, come to you. to hear this, and thank you for this very warm intro for me to come to the stage, and thank you to the foundation for giving me a spot that is like, wow. I mean, I couldn't have asked for a better spot. 10 o'clock in the morning, on a Saturday, you wake up, you have your coffee, you come in, and, and the weather helped. It's not beautiful, it's rainy, so you're gonna have to be indoors. So, that said, very the first slide is one that um, shows you where I work. One thing I was happy about is that many people who are presenting so far have thanked the NIDCG for the funding, and I very much thank the PIs who have done that. And I want to thank the NIDCD for offering me a lovely place to work. I have been there 16 years, I love what we do, I love our mission, and and I love that we all contribute to paying my salary. This is funded <laughs> by tax dollars. So thank you for that. I just push enter. The title of my talk was this, NIDCD Funding of Voice Research. That's the one that I sent in February to Maria. I changed my mind. The title now is Charter and <laughs> It has my email underneath. It has another language, for those of you who can read it, to prompt me to ask you my next question. Who here speaks English as a second language? Thank you. Raise it higher so I can really, really see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 14, 15, 16, 17, not bad, and probably more will come in. Um, I say that because I'm gonna speak about collaboration and international collaboration, and I know that the Voice Foundation attracts people from all over the world, so that's it. If there was nobody, then I was gonna cut that part maybe to a small group. Um, anybody could read the language before or can name the phone? Never mind, we won't get there. Um, so, chalk and cheese. These are the topics I'm going to be talking about in the chalk and cheese talk. And if you missed the talk that Jan gave, you missed a really good talk. That panel, not only his, was, was wonderful. I'm going to walk you through bits and pieces. I have the time that I have, I'll do my best to not go over. Um, and if I go over, I think, I think I'm going to yeah, get that. Yeah. And if there's anything, and I'll leave enough time for questions, but I want to give you enough of a flavor because this is a diverse group. There are people in this room who are funded, who have reviewed, and there are people in here who probably go, NIH, what's that? Because there was a time when I was like that. Okay, NIH. And if you, if you notice the front, front slide had institutes, plural. NIH is a collection of institutes. It's not the National Institute of Health, but the National Institutes of Health. We're a collection of institutes. I work at one of them. We're a collection of institutes and centers. Um, we have a big budget. This year, we're lucky Congress decided to give us a bump, so actually we're around $34 billion at the, uh, at the whole NIH. NIDCD is one of them. It's one of the smaller ones. It 
existed longer than 1988, but it used to exist as a different name. It was connected to the Neurology Institute, the NINCDS, and our budget this year, in 2016, is 437. So really, when you're thinking about budget, you're thinking about NINCD being about one, one and a half percent of all of NIH. There are three institutes that eat half the budget of the NIH, and that is Cancer Institute, Allergy Infectious Diseases, and Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, because these are the biggest public health challenges um, in the US. So when you think about NIDCD um, and 1%, you can see that sometimes I, if somebody calls me and I say, great science, lovely, relevant for NIH, but not relevant to the voice program, because I'm even part of that 1%, and so I have to decide how we're going to spend our money. That's, after all, why you pay me. You pay me to be a steward of our dollars. That's our tagline, NIH turning discovery into health. That is the NIH tagline. The one below that is my personal tagline. That is on my signature block, because I genuinely believe that. And yesterday, I used Google to give you the French one. I asked a friend of mine, who's Francophone, if Google did it right, because I don't remember my grammar that I knew in French when I was a kid. Hopefully, the French is good. And if there is a mistake, let us know. But Louis Pasteur said that, and I think it's my guiding principle. Funding a little bit, it comes and goes. People will be asking, what's it like next year? We are in a different um, administration. The funding, as you saw, once dipped in 2013 from 2012. That's the sequestration that happened. Now it's beginning to go up. Yes, we're at 437 this year. Um, that's the NIDCD funding, but who knows what 2018 is gonna be. We have a budget proposed by the president. It means cuts, um, but then Congress has to look at that and give us a budget. So we might be lucky and get more than 437, or we might be 300 something, we don't know. 90% of the budget is coming out to the community. It goes in extramural research. We fund the researchers, you. 10% um, is the, mo the money that funds the internal researchers. At, at NIDCD, those internal researchers, for the most part, are hearing-based researchers. We don't have um, any more any science and output um, in communication disorders. It's mostly on the way. Um, the pipeline is all in the hearing center. That is how we're organized. We're organized into seven program areas. That's congressional language, so if people care about Swallow, so do I. It's not me that made the rules. It is voice, it's about communication, it's about laryngeal function, um, communicative laryngeal function, swallowing. Um, I do my share of funneling it to the right institute and working with the community to make sure it goes to the right home. Cancer can be the right home, neurology can be the right home, aging can be the right home, NIDDK, digestion uh, can be the right home, nursing can be the right home. Um, so I find you a home. My interest is communication. And it's not only clinical, it's everything. Basic clinical translation and outcomes, et cetera. Right now, there's something like big dissemination and implementation research, because we know that science doesn't get implemented fast enough to um, uh, improve public health. So I'm the contact for uh, DNI research. That's how the money is distributed. That is the FY16 budget. You can see that hearing is 54% of the budget. Balance is 6%. Voice is 7% of that 1% of the NIH. Um, that's not the way, that's not our preference. That's just how the pipeline is. The pipeline and the success rate. So it's, the pi it's driven by the applicants. Nobody sat down and said, I want to have 54% of the money to go to hearing. No, there's just way more hearing scientists. There are way more otologists um, applying for NIH. So the reason I want to be here is because I care about the voice and I would like to see more of you successful and in that pipeline so that the number could inch up. Even if it goes to 9%, woo-hoo-hoo! <laughs> so, okay. That's the research training mission. So I'm, I'm a program officer, I direct the voice and speech program. Then there's a whole thing that's called research training and career development. 
and there's a different program officer for that, and we work together. So that's the mission for the research training, which is to increase the number, I share that too, increase the quality, I share that too, and, in, and the diversity, and I share that too. And we all want well-prepared prepared and skilled investigators, right? So, and then we want to support interdisciplinary teams, big team science, in fact, if you're if you love team science and large team science, look at that website that says team science that is at the NIH. It's a big effort um, spearhead by the National Cancer Institute. And I put that down here. Not that I don't love PhDs, I'm one of them. And not that I don't love clinician scientists who are PhDs, I'm one of them. But I think that we need to have a mix of training and it would be lovely to increase the pipeline in physician scientists. So that leads me to my next question. How many people in this room identify or have trained as physicians? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. There are more people who spoke English as a second language in this room than there are physicians. Okay, that gives us something to know, right? Interesting. They all have other things to do. Um, all right, this little image tells you a little bit about who to contact. NIH is maybe 24,000 people, I don't know, something like that, full of MDs, full of PhDs, and full of very well-talented um, and skilled people. You can cluster us in three big job groups, program officer, scientific review officer, and grants management officer. And the word officer is government speak, I'm sorry. Um, it is what it is. This tells you who to contact. I'm a program officer. I'm the one to approach for science-based questions. Approach me before you apply, but once you apply and that application is in, I'm no longer your contact person. You can copy me on your communication so that I'm in the loop, but your contact person is a scientific review officer. From the moment that Office of Sponsored Research hits send, and the application has gone into cyberspace and has been received, I'm no longer, I cannot answer questions because all the SROs answer the questions because they have to exercise fairness across all of NIH and they don't want, we don't want variation by institute. So it's all the SROs. Um, they convene the meetings, they approach reviewers, they generate the summary statement. You don't like your review? I didn't write the summary statement. <laughs> The grants management person is the person who talks with your Office of Sponsored Research. That's the channel. The channel is between PIs and SROs and POs, program officers, and the other channel, the grants management channel, is the Office of Sponsored Research. So anything they need to do, they really should talk to them so that things don't fall and somebody says we emailed and we don't know where that email went. Okay, the strategic plan. Pay attention to this because I think it's one of the ASHA outcomes, and I don't know if it's a CME outcome, but if you want to do, do that little thing for uh, continuing out, it says that you should know to summarize the strategic plan. The strategic plan um, is something that is done periodically. We just renewed it in February 2017. It is not our doing. It is our doing with collaboration from the community. So there are experts that come in that help us um, update it. And that's the... Um, the updated one of 2017 to 2021. It's basically these four big areas. So every literally anything under the sun in the domain of communication disorders could be it. Understanding normal function, and I give you just some example bullets that's underneath in the voice uh, part. Understanding diseases and disorders. Again, diseases and disorders that affect communication, uh, not so much ankle. Um, improving diagnosis and treatment and then improving outcomes for human communication. And some bullets are like novel delivery, um, comparative effectiveness research, evidence-based medicine or evidence-based practice, etc. things like that. That's the link so that you can find them. I really encourage you to look at it. You don't have to read it for, for word, but really know what's interesting at least in the bullets so that you can craft um, your application. Now we move to the mechanisms. We have something for everyone. Mechanism is just a word to say what we offer. What is the menu of choices in terms of grants that you could apply for? Remember, it's an application until awarded. 
You don't write grants. You write applications for grants. Um, so, and we have different mechanisms of this um, grant support. The decision that you make should be that you follow your passion, but pick one that fits you. Where are you in your career? And there is one really truly for wherever you are in the trajectory. Not all the mechanisms are used by NIH, by all the different NIH institutes. There's a lot more at NIH than NIDCD chooses, so make sure that you're using the right one for NIDCD if you intend to submit to NIDCD. And don't use one that we don't use, send it to the system, and then find out that we cannot review it. And then it delays you by a cycle. And start early. Um, I started to say something that I got an email yesterday at 6.30 from somebody who wants to submit this Monday, the deadline is this Monday, asking me to intervene. I have never heard of this person. 6.30, technically I'm on duty, you know, sort of at the end. I'm a, you know, I, I picked at it. I was like, really, now? Your seat takes this Monday. I mean, but somebody did that. All right, so this is what I just told you about in the sense that we have something for everybody, pre-doc, career development, junior investigators, experienced investigators, the P50, which is a huge multi-component system, and uh, some of you may have heard, we, we um, NIGCD awarded its first voice P50 ever, so it's out there. Um, and then we have clinical trials, which are called U01s, because they're cooperative agreements, and then we have small business uh, programs. The R01 is the prize and joy. It is the workhorse. Um, it is not probably something that people start with unless they are lucky. Um, there are uh, cycling, um, what is it, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, training cycle wheels. So there are other mechanisms that can get you to the, to the R01. It's the oldest and it's the largest. It, um, the R21 Exploratory Developmental, it's a smaller program, it's for two years, it's when you have um, a small idea, you don't have yet enough feasibility data, you want to test something out. It is not something that I would suggest also for a brand new person. I, the R21 is probably best used by somebody who has had their R, R01 and now wants to branch out and get some more data, just because it's just as competitive as the R01 at NIDCD. Mm -hmm. The Area Academic Research Enhancement Award is um, a smaller grant than the R01, and it is for institutions that don't get a lot of NIH money. If you look to see where NIH money is spent, you can see it's sort of clustered. East Coast, West Coast, and there are parts of the country that don't get it. There are universities that don't get it. So this is to try and um, spread the wealth in a way and make sure that universities that train undergraduates get some research money so that they can bring um, increase the strength of the pipeline. And sometimes a program is eligible at a university and another program may not be eligible at a university. So it could be at the med school at some university is ineligible because they've, you know, they've been getting a lot of money and the School of Nursing is eligible. So you have to really go online to see if your program is eligible for the area grant, because it has to do with the distribution of the funds at those universities. Because you know, universities have different schools, School of Nursing, School of Education, School of this, School of that. Um, a lot of people say there isn't a funding opportunity for what I want to do. You don't need one. Parent, unsolicited, or investigator initiated applications. NIH is run by these. Just if you have a great idea, there isn't a voice FOA or there isn't a spasmodic FOA, it's funding opportunity announcement. Or there isn't an SD FOA or there isn't a transgender FOA. Send it as an investigator initiated. It will still be reviewed and it will be considered for funding. This is um, an image of the R01 um, FOA. So, one thing to see, you see PA 16160, 16 means it was issued in 2016. So if you Google and you find PA 4, blah, 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 don't use it. That means it's 2004 and Google just took it to the wrong one. So pick the most recent to the fiscal year that you're in. So we're in right now 2017, right? 
we have standard receipt dates. Now, the funding opportunity announcements, most of them have standard receipt dates. June 5th, this Monday. Um, but some don't follow that rule. So read the exact one. Some have special receipt dates. We love new investigators. We support in new investigators. Sometimes the elders eat the young, but it's not the institute. Um, that happens at review sometimes, but it's okay. We try, I think they try not to. So we look at two categories, new investigators and early stage investigators. These distinctions, these designations are only relevant to the R01. The R01, it doesn't matter for the R21, it doesn't matter for the R03 and ESI status and NI. They, such investigators get clustered at the review meeting, they get reviewed together, sort of, so that the review committee looks at them similarly, so that they are uh, treated fairly, so they're not compared to their very senior investigators who have maybe 17 R01s or whatever they have, okay? So, um, ESIs. You really want to be an ESI. Uh, you don't want to submit for your NEI your um, R01 much later, so that you can have the consideration of being an early stage, i.e. within 10 years of completing your uh, terminal degree. Oh, 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 oh. Right. And this is our, the NIDCD commitment, not only the NIH commitment, but this is in addition, um, this is um, the NIDCD saying that we want you to apply to something within seven years, not within 10 years. And that is what we call the early career um, researchers. It used to be called the RO3, so if people say, oh, I, I want to apply to the NIDCD RO3, it doesn't exist. This is now called an ECR R21. Basically, it's the same thing as the old RO3. It's for you to apply within seven years from your terminal degree. Why seven years? Because we want you to get that finished and apply to your R01 before the 10 year clock hits. Um, so that you don't linger in la la land of postdochood or you, know, you get your R01 while you're still um, able. Uh, our, other, our commitments also to um, early career is what we do, the expedited review in fellowships. So that gets turned around um, fast. In 33, it says. Our website, it's a new clip made by the hearing and speech. Um, also to remind me to say that we have a new physician with us. We're mostly at NIDCD on the extramural side. I think we're all PhDs. We have one uh, physician, and that is Trinity. She just joined us. For those of you who knew Gordon Hughes when he used to run our clinical trials program, Trin is a physician who runs our clinical trials program. So if any of you are interested in clinical trials, she's the point of contact in addition to me. Um, a clip about our website so that you can find funding opportunity announcements. That's a clip that is recent. You can see right now PA 17227 in hearing. Hearing, but if you look down, you see that we have improved outcomes. That's available for everybody in the domain of communication. It's not only hearing, uh, both in R01 and R21. We had a voice workshop in May 2013. Um, thanks to the Voice Foundation for helping us do that then. And uh, we generated program announcements in voice. You can see they expire soon. So that means with the, with the receipt date June 5th, your last chance to submit, unless you want to submit very early before they expire. But I just want to say, it doesn't really matter that there's no voice program announcement because you can always come in under the parent R1. This was out there for three years. I'm not renewing it. So I might renew it next year or the year after. But for right now, um, you can come in as a parent in, under the parent investigator. This is yesterday's weekly NIH funding opportunity. If you don't get this and you like research, research, please subscribe to this. It tells you what's happening at all of NIH. It gives you a flavor about big science, what other institutes are doing, what precision medicine is doing, what, and maybe it will also um, spur you for ways of collaboration across domains. And that's how you subscribe to the NIH guide. Yesterday here, there was a panel, a lovely panel, on uh, transgender health. And so I wanted to point out to the people who were not in that room, if you missed it, that NIH has a sex and gender minorities office. 
NIH is a collection of what I said of institutes and centers and offices. It's really ICOs, um, and this office um, facilitates most of the work on sex and gender uh, minorities at, um, that's supported by NIH. So the transnet that was mentioned yesterday was an activity facilitated by this office. Um, we have. Uh, three active funding opportunity announcements in that domain. The RO3, it says NIDCD does not, does not participate because we don't. We don't do the RO3 anymore, but we participate in the area, the RO1 and the R21, and these will expire next year. And it says at the bottom, domestic and foreign applicants are eligible. There's always, there was an administrative supplement. This has expired. I just put it out there to cue you that there might be, it might get reissued. So if this is a domain of area that you want to work in, um, certainly do. The administrative supplements are for people who are already awarded and funded so that they can supplement their um, research. And it's administrative. It does not get peer-reviewed. It, get, it gets administratively reviewed. Um, 10.37, we end at what time? Uh, 10.55. 10.55, OK. So NIH funding is done by peer review. It's not done by I, your best friend. It has a one to nine scoring system. And it shows you um, high, medium, and low. They don't score all the applications that are seen in the meeting. Um, they try to score the top 40% by ranking, sometimes 45, et cetera. And that's because we cannot award everything. So all the science is good. It all gets reviewed. It just doesn't get discussed. So it does get the benefit of a peer review critique, just not the discussion that is live, that is heard by the program officer. Um, and so you can look at the descriptors and see it really is exceptional, outstanding, excellent, very good, good, satisfactory, fair, marginal, poor. They don't discuss anything from good, sometimes even very good doesn't get discussed. Sometimes they might focus on only discuss uh, exceptional, outstanding, excellent. And here I want to say a word about not discuss. It's not the end of the world. And I say this to people. Somebody got the Nobel Prize the same week their NIH application got an ND designation. It's not the end of the world. It just means the quality of that particular application did not compete well enough. But that person got the Nobel Prize. Can't tell you who it is. All right, these are the criteria. You should know this by heart. These are the things to look at. Write your application that way. Sell the significance. If it's not significant, why should we spend the dollars on it? It might be lovely, but maybe it just needs to find its own way of being funded. Um, all right, the approach is really important because that's the quality of the science. Investigators and environment are often very, very good. So how could you get that better? I mean, if you're at a stellar university, what are you gonna do, go to a stellar, stellar university? So I mean, really focus on asking a significant question. Why should this be considered for funding? And make your approach and your methods really, really strong. Then there are additional review criteria, self-explanatory. Under resubmissions, they look to see if you've been responsive to the critiques under renewals to see how productive you were. If you had a grant for five years and only one publication came, no, 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 you know? You must have a very, very good reason for why you do not generate more than one uh, publication. That just shows you again, this is a picture, a graphic that reviewers get about how to score, but overall, you know, a score of five is good, but they do, they rate the impact of this whole application and then they take the review criteria and give them scores. My next one, who is eligible to apply? Can the Australians apply? Can the Canadians apply? Can the Nigerians apply? Can the Jordanians apply? Depends on the FOA. The NIH is lovely. It does not say only Americans can apply to research funding supported by U.S. tax dollars. Most people don't know that, and they think, really? The NIH will take an application in, I don't know, Ecuador? 
Yeah, if the funding opportunity announcement says that, yes. So it really depends on that particular FOA. All the parents' announcements allow foreign institutions to apply. Sometimes there's a specific RFA that is targeted. So RFAs might be a little bit strict because it's so targeted. The P50, the big mechanism, that one doesn't go away. That does not, it does not cross the shores. It doesn't go to Mexico, it doesn't go to Canada. That has to be at a US-based institutions. It can have some component that is in Chile. That's okay. But the award is the American institution that gets it. And you see me talk about the institution because there is individual eligibility and institutional eligibility. So the applicant has to be qualified, the person, the PI, the investigator, and the institution. So eligibility, when you read the FOA, look to see the institutional um, eligibility. So now it doesn't happen just like that, that the foreign institution gets the grant. It has to um, meet certain criteria. In this particular slide, you see that not all mechanisms are eligible. So there are certain mechanisms that are not eligible for um, or open to foreign institutions. And that's the research training. Research training mandated by Congress. The United States will train US um, scientists who are at US institutions. If you're an American, and it requires that the applicant, the person who's applying, be a, either a US citizen or a green card holder. If you're not on such visas, or such persons, and you're on a different kind of visa, you're ineligible to apply to the research training. You can be an American citizen, apply to an NRSA, and take it with you to Karolinska, and that's fine. So think about that if you want to um, train with somebody abroad. More on foreign, this is an important one. This is basically the review criterion that foreign applications have to meet. It's an additional review criterion. So the reviewers will look to see if the proposed research should provide special opportunities, maybe a special population in Brazil that we don't have in the United States, I don't know, that we could pursue to study and learn something, or unusual talent present in the um, PI. That's the first part of the criterion. The second part of the criterion is that the science may not be readily available in the US or can augment existing US resources. A lot of science can augment US, US resources. So a lot of reviewers pay attention to the first one and forget the second part. So the NIH language is really more inclusive but I think sometimes some individual reviewers or maybe some individual program officers might be a little bit xenophobic in how they in interpret that. So that is a message that I keep saying, you know, NIH language allows us to take foreign applications. I think this is for me um, clarifying um, the criterion which I just basically said. And I think I told you about that one too. All right. Besides looking at the NIDCD website and the research training website, look at the Office of Extramural Research because that has a lot more resources. Like right now they're dealing with um, the uh, citation index. They're dealing with um, a cap on the number of grants that people have um, because there are people who have lots and lots of grants and other people are not um, having as, as much. So these are big things that um, NIH is, is looking at. Rigor of reproducibility has been a topic that was addressed in the past year. Um, I have lots of slides on training, but I am not the program officer for training, so I'm going to just go through them like this and maybe allow you to ask me questions. So that's the research training model. You can look at that. We have fellowships, career development, and we have supplements. Pre-doc, post-doc faculty, and then these are the um, program announcements for the NRSA. I'm just going to go like that. This had something for audiologists. I almost took it out, but then I went, no, keep it in. Um, I know this audience is mostly voice, but this shows, shows you that NIDCD has been doing stuff also targeted to audiologists. And if you know the community says, you know, Lana, we really need something targeted to voice, training, 
you know, Alberto and I would be happy to talk with the community to see about crafting a program announcement for that. Career, we have the loan repayment program. We know a lot of people come out with school with lots of loan debt, and there's that, more career. Do look at the website, do contact me, send an email, please do not submit cold, you're missing a chance. Um, there's something called the NIH Reporter, look at that, it tells you what we have funded, but one caveat, just because we funded it does not mean that we will fund it again, that's because our budget times are tighter. So if we had a lot, you know, people come to me and say, but you funded all this to stage our work, and I say, yes, I know. But that's when the pay line was the 30th percentile. Now the pay line is 13th percentile. So we have narrowed in to whatever our congressional language mandates, and that's the law. These are just slides on training, and this is my last slide that I had. Um, you can't just cross the sea merely by standing and st staring at the water. So do your work, email me, jump in and get to the other side of the sea. And email me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, so we have some time for some questions here for the next couple minutes. Um, but I want to say one thing. Every single individual in this room is a scholar. You wouldn't be here if you were not a scholar. Okay, so in the room, who presently has NIH, NIH funding? Present or past? NIH funding. Raise your hands. Hi. Okay. Yay. Who wants NIH funding? <laughs> All right. So we want to bridge this gap. And uh, just a couple quick questions to start uh, the Q&A off. Um, do you need to have a doctoral degree in order to be MH funded? There's practical stuff. We've got a, a mix of folks in our audience. Um, I have had, I've been at MIH 16 years. I've had one person with a master's degree who had an R grant, an RPG. Of course, you don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to have a PhD to have a pre-doctoral fellowship, right? That's targeted towards the people who are in a doctoral program. So the research training is targeted to pre-docs, post-docs, and then individuals with their terminal degree to get their you know, career development. But again, the, the funding opportunity announcement does not, did not restrict or require PhDs. And hence, there, were, there was this person with a master's degree who did get, at the time, an R3. So uh, yes, probably it's better to have a PhD if you're trying for the RPG, R01 or R21. Or an MD. That's your terminal degree. And then I guess my next question is, um, how important is it to have funding outside of the NIH prior to a the prior to applying for an NIH grant, like mm -hmm. whether it's an institutional grant or whether it's um, um, mm -hmm. or foundational grants, mm -hmm. where do you recommend people start? So if you're in the field of speech language pathology, there is the American Speech Language Hearing Foundation that does lessons for success. That's been a really strong pipeline. A lot of people get their seed money and um, apply them to pre-docs and they've been really successful. We've been, we've been tracking that and that has been a really strong pipeline. Um, and then seed money for RPGs from the universities also. And then attend, I would suggest that people attend more um, in-depth training like the one that's called Lessons for Success and then one done at the ARO at Cambia Research and Oral Anthology. So can you give us a little advice on mentorship so so many people in this room have just ideas about what they want to discover how do you take that idea and bring it into a structured grant proposal whether it's for the NIH or whether it's for your university or or whatnot so it, I would say in terms of picking the mentor pick a mentor who is available 
and yes, funded, but available. There are mentors who have lots of grants. They would be wonderful on paper, but they don't have the time to read your application. And they don't read your application, and the application gets submitted and you go, that mentor did not look at that application. So pick a mentor who really embodies actual mentorship and has the time to engage with you to talk and, and mentor. Um, the idea that you have, um, flush it out, run it by some close friends to see if it's significant, probably up from outside the field. Does it really make sense? I mean, we talk about water and hydration. We don't really have science to say that we need eight glasses of water, do we? We don't. The Institute of Medicine has told us to do that. That is your recommendation. Um, but we might need, you know, some uh, support on that, evidence on that. So if we drink, we don't have any science that tells us stop drinking those Coca-Colas. <coughs> We have dietary, but you know we're not looking enough at voice. So, yeah, where was I? <laughs> and and um, another, please start coming up to the. Um, I don't want. I don't want to be asking the questions. Um, how important is it for your mentors to be in, say, otolaryngology, speech language pathology, or voice science? in terms of an application to the NIPCP? Or can your mentor be from virology or wherever? They can be, and it also depends on what application you're doing. If you're doing an F mechanism, if you're applying for a pre-doc, then you'll want your mentors to be close to the field that you're doing, and maybe from outside. But if you're doing a career development, they could be as far off as possible. They could be, you could be somebody who's a basic scientist who has only worked with rats, and now you want to do something and learn more about team science and dissemination and implementation and retool. You could be somebody who um, does behavior and does speech sound disorders, but wants to know more about genetics, and now go into retool into genetics. And that actually is being done right now by people who are into FOXP2, the gene for speech. And so we have behavioral scientists who are training with very basic mice scientists. And we want that. We want this cross-disciplinary animal to human, human to animal translation. Just because animal research in human communication disorders, it's a hard model to, to translate to. If you can do it in voice easier than you can do it in language and semantics. Yes? I'm curious if NIDCD is placing high priority with non-phonatory disorders, such as paradoxical vocal fold motion. Um, I don't know that we're placing higher priority or not. I mean, we take it, we look at the specific aims, and we see what are the measures in it. If it's more on respiratory, then we might funnel it to NHLBI. Again, not because we don't like it or love it, it's trying to protect our 1% of that NIH budget so that we can fund the things that other institutes may not fund. For example, stuttering. Nobody is going to take stuttering. So if NHL, other than us. So if NHLBI is willing to take paradoxical vocal fold disorders, that gives us a little bit more money to fund stuttering. And it's not that we say, no, it's not us. It's just, we find, if you're doing, like, if somebody is doing uh, head and neck cancer work and voice outcomes, I love voice, but I will not take it. I'm sorry. NCI has 30% of the NIH budget. They could, if it's meritorious, they could fund it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ron. Are there, hi. Uh, there are still only two possible reviews before you can't then put in a third. That has changed, and i.e., it used to be that you could not come back again as a brand new one. Now, you know, yes, you have your O1 submission, you have your amended submission. You don't make it, okay? If you want to craft that same application but be as responsive as possible to the reviewers, and bring it in as a brand new application, you can, provided it is within the window of either 34 or 36 months. So you can. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, they took that away. Oh, yes. 
It has to be timely, it has to be relevant within that time window. Did you see chalk and cheese, or did you walk in after that? You missed my chalk and cheese slide. Oh, oh good, good. <laughs> I can hear you. Music to my ear. So the question is, what about collaborative research between U.S. institutions and foreign institutions? And like I said, it's music to my ears. The question would be, who, which institution is going to be the applicant? Is the institution Vanderbilt, which is domestic, or is the institution your institution in Prague, which is foreign? So if the institution, and you can, that's where private conversations would be useful. If it comes from Vanderbilt, the reviewers should not address that review criterion that I showed you because it's not a foreign application. It's a domestic application from Vanderbilt. Now there are reviewers who will bring it up because they think they are being due, dil due diligent and they will overgeneralize the rule and say, oh, this is going with the da da prep. They don't even have to discuss this. This is an application from a US institution. Now, if you apply, you know, from the application came from Prague, then that's a foreign application. And that needs to be addressed with that review criterion. Is there something that you offer? Is there something special? Or are there other scientists in the United States at domestic institutions who can do your work as well? Then some reviewers will say we shouldn't send it there. But they forget that last sentence which is augment resources, and your science could augment. And that becomes that interpretation of the head, the personal and the politics of that particular individual who reviews the application. Did I answer this, though? Yes, thank you. One last question, and we're leave a moment for transition. Um, what's, the, what's the general breakdown of, say, just of the, the voice swath of the NIDCD? What's the breakdown between clinical research versus translational and basic research in terms of what is present? I have that data, and I actually pulled it. Um, I would say I have more basic and translational than we have clinical, but that doesn't mean we don't have clinical. So. If you're interested in clinical research, there's no barriers? There is no structural barrier to that. It's really a matter of merit of the application, significance and approach and the committee, and doing your work prior to submission so that the application itself is strong. But there's no bias. And like I said, we have the outcomes, so now there's a solicitation for outcomes research, which one could say is more clinical. Lana, thank you so much. Thank this is a you. great session.